Uh, my name is Peter Alger. I uh, head up engineering with uh, Nearform. Uh, as you probably know, we've been heavily involved with Node.js um, from, from the start of, really. Um, we're putting uh, systems live in Node, um, really in uh, probably about version 0 04, um, so back in 2011. Um, and one of the things we found with Node uh, was that it kind of naturally led us to building microservice-based systems. The small kind of modular uh, structure that you get um, naturally uh, pushes you into the direction of writing small components uh, that interact with each other uh, rather than kind of building um, monolithic uh, type systems. Um, you, you don't really have the, the, the need or the, um, or the drive to use uh, class hierarchies and all that kind of stuff when you're building systems in Node. How many people here are actually putting systems into production with Node right now? Okay, so a good, a good bunch. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about is, is a bit of uh, our journey, a uh, part of our journey in uh, using microservices um, and how we've kind of adapted ourselves as we've learned more about applying microservice architectures um, with our clients um, and some tooling that we've created to help us become more efficient. Um, we run a lot of projects. Uh, we have a lot of ongoing projects. A lot of those projects that we run are microservice based. That's not to say that we apply a golden hammer approach to architecture. We certainly don't do that. Uh, we apply a microservice pattern where it's appropriate. Um, and in a lot of cases for the projects that we work on that are kind of enterprise type node systems, um, it's, a, it's a very uh, appropriate pattern. Okay, so the first thing to say is that microservices are not really a new concept. Um, for me, it's really a, a relearning or a rediscovery of, of good engineering or good software engineering principles. Um, and that means having small, uh, focused, decoupled components, um, having very strong component boundaries, um, which gives you small bits of code which are easier to reason about uh, and easier to develop in isolation. Um, and it, as I said, it's an architectural style which is particularly suited to Node.js. Um, so, for example, if you, look at, if you look at one of the most successful software systems ever written, that might be a matter of opinion, uh, but if you look at the Unix command line, it's been around for a very long time. Um, you can view that as a microservice system. There are small components, and they all know how to do one thing well. So, anyone, tell me what the first line does. Sorry. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Counts the JavaScript files in a in a in a given directory, right? And it does that, to do that, it uses three different components or three different services, right? So ls knows how to list files, grep knows how to search for, str for strings, and wc knows how to count lines, right? So you can see that as the interaction of three microservices to give you a, a desired result, okay? Sorry? Can uh, No. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I typed that on the train. I typed that on the train. The point is, is to illustrate the point. I tested the rest of the code, but not that, right? So, does anyone want to give me a hazard a guess to what the, the second one does? It deletes all the Java files. It deletes all the Java files, absolutely. There you go. Um, so as I said, I think that you know, when you compare the way that the microservices work with the way that having small uh, units of code that you can reason about easily, when you compare them to class hierarchies, um, when you look at this type of Java class hierarchy, um, that to me is kind of really difficult and confusing. Um, you have this kind of uh, notion of, of animal and extending it with cat and all these kind of, kinds of things that you, you, you do in a class-based uh, system, um, the amount of pain and uh, human misery that has been expended on creating inheritance and features like that in languages, which are frankly um, not the best way to build systems, they lead to highly coupled monolithic type architectures. Okay, so really, um, I see microservices as a move away from this type of architecture, away from this type of uh, approach to doing things. And that's awesome, and it's great. And writing microservices in isolation is, 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 a, is an easy win. But has anyone come across the term shell hell? Anyone here writing microservices? One. Okay. 
Have you come across the term of Shell Harrow? Have you experienced Shell Harrow? Yeah, but I've been talked to Dean. <laughs> okay. How about you? Yeah. yeah. Sure. So Shell Harrow is a term, uh, the, 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 a recent term, that's come about as people have started to uh, develop microservices, uh, which says that, you know, really, yes, uh, it's, it's easy to reason about the individual services, but when you want to tear up the entire system in development, uh, you have a challenge. Because now, instead of just running a single process, you've got to run multiple processes. If you want to run your entire system, you have to pull up service A, B, C, and D, along with um, some supporting data tiers and also various front ends, and that becomes a more complex thing to manage. So whilst, you have the whilst you've removed a lot of the complexity at the individual code level, you've added some complexity, um, particularly in local development, um, around having to run all of these interoperating processes. So there's a number of trade-offs with microservices, okay? On the plus side, you have smaller units of code, they're easier to reason about, easier to test, um, and they support the, the more rapid incremental deployment, the continuous delivery models, um, which, uh, which, which, are, which are becoming much more popular, and for, for good reason, obviously, because um, the, the more rapidly you can get features into production, the quicker your development cycles, um, the, the better things are, the, the, the faster you get features to market. When you compare that with monoliths, you have a much larger amount of code, usually in a couple class hierarchy. Um, show of hands, anyone here doing Java Day today? Java, okay, C Sharp. Okay, I'm missing some hands. PHP, maybe? Okay, all right. So typically in those environments, and I've, I've written an awful lot of Java code as well, um, and, and a fair bit of C Sharp as well, you, you tend to write these monolithic um, code bases um, and after they get past a certain size, they become quite difficult to reason about and become difficult to work with. And you tend to get software entry setting in. Um, and that then uh, percolates down into your deployments, which become riskier. You have longer testing cycles. Um, and things just become um, slower and, and difficult over time, particularly as people then leave the company. Um, you might have three generations of programmers working on a particular software system, and no one really blocks the entire code base anymore. Um, so, whilst that's true, on the, on the other side, um, it's, it's harder, there, there is more complexity in deploying a microservice system, right? Um, because you have more moving parts to deploy, um, and it's much trickier to, uh, to apply a standard kind of debugging and uh, tooling to microservices. Whereas monoliths, um, all of our tooling is actually uh, oriented around monolithic development. If you look at all of our standard IDEs today, they're all um, Oriented around how you how you would build a, a monolithic code base. Okay, so kind of as a microservice developer, you probably feel a bit like the guy at the bottom um, when you're trying to apply uh, the current set of tools that you have to microservices. Right. So what are our options? There's a few common approaches. Right. So one is uh, just to develop services in isolation. Um, so you might have a team or, or a couple of guys that are working on a particular service. They write uh, tests, they get that service working to, uh, to a good level, um, and then you have some kind of shared staging system where you do your integration. So all developers then just push their code up, you get some kind of regular build uh, onto that staging system. Not the best way to do it, to be honest. Um, another approach is to uh, write custom scripts. Um, and I'm sure uh, there are people here that are doing microservices that have been through this loop. We've been through this loop as well. Um, you write custom bash scripts or, or use node or whatever it is to um, tear your system up, um, even to, to run checkouts, to run builds um, across the, your whole slew of services. And that's fine, um, and it works pretty well, um, but the, I guess the issue is that if, you have to, if you're doing a lot of projects like we do, you have to repeat that for every project that you're doing, uh, which, is, which can be pretty inefficient. Uh, another approach is to use containers. Um, how many people here, just to show hands, are using Docker or have experience of using Docker? So, a few people, right? Is that all the way through to production or just been just playing with it? Anyone using it in production? Okay, so one or two guys using it in production. Um, so we're, we're, we're big fans of Docker. We're big, fan of, big fans of the whole containerization model and the whole drive towards containers. I think that it's, it's a great approach. Um, it's a really great approach in production. Um, we tried using uh, Docker and tools like Docker Compose um, in, uh, in development, and it can work well. Um, the problem is that it does, does bring in a certain amount of friction. 
Um, the two key friction points are really that um, if you have to build another container layer and stop and restart every time you make a change, it slows you down. Um, the, other, the other point is that if you're using a Mac or a Windows system, i.e. you're not using Docker natively, uh, then you have a bunch of issues to deal with around running a VM and um, different, having different IP addresses and so on. So configuring the code could be, um, could be pro problematic. And then finally, I guess, applying debuggers uh, in that context becomes a little more difficult as well because you have to configure a base VM and set up for debugging and so on. If you haven't experienced the joys of this, um, then uh, <laughs> I invite you to go and have a go. Uh, you'll, you'll have a lot of fun. So. Um, those experiences of, of trying those different approaches on projects uh, led us to create a tool called Fuge um, from Centrifuge. Uh, play on words as in microbes, microbial, I think. You see what I did? Yeah? I will push it. Um, code's all up on GitHub, you can, you can check it out there um, under the, uh, the apparatus organization. Um, I really had a few key goals in uh, creating Fuge. Um, one was to provide a tool that uh, gave us a, a, a microservice scaffolding. Um, and the first version, um, the scaffolding was all oriented around the tool chains that we use at Nearform. Um, but I'll talk a little bit later about how we're hoping to open that up uh, to a wider set of generators. Um, and the second thing was to provide a runtime environment for microservices um, to really get rid of that, that friction to allow us mix, to mix containers and um, processes or services um, in development to ease our debugging experience and to really speed up our development cycles. So um, just a quick word about the stack that we use uh, on most projects. Um, you're probably familiar with the, both of these frameworks, Happy and Seneca. Everybody familiar? Yes? No? Okay. If you use Node for a while, you'll come across both of these frameworks. So um, Happy is a, a web framework that came out of Walmart Labs. Um, been used very successfully in production by the guys there. Uh, and Seneca is uh, our homegrown um, Nearform framework started by uh, Richard, our CTO. Um, and when I talk about a microservice system, this is kind of typically the type of architecture I'm talking about. So uh, at, at the top level, you've got um, some form of API routing layer. Um, and within that, you've got some static assets. When I say static assets, what I mean is typically we're dealing with like a single page application. So you might have uh, maybe an Angular or a React uh, front end in there um, with its own set of JavaScript code and, and front end widgets and whatever uh, is in there. Um, and then the routing layer. But then behind that, there's some kind of discovery mechanism or some kind of overlay network um, which allows you to um, determine which, the endpoints for services. Okay? And then we will categorize our system into two real two distinct types of um, services that operate in two different time domains. So one would be um, direct response services. So these are typically services that um, are called directly over a HTTP interface. So they're point to point. Um, a request comes in to the API layer, which means you directly here, and you get a response back. And these services are responsible for calling into legacy APIs, just accessing a data store, or talking to some form of external API, say a payment service or whatever. And then the other type of service uh, are the more asynchronous type services, which you might hang, a, hang off of some type of uh, message bus, so RabbitMQ or, or something like that. And those types of services don't necessarily require an immediate response uh, for, for rendering on the front end. Okay? So that's the type of system I'm talking about uh, when I'm referring to a, a microservice system. So, um, How are you running this? In production, uh, we would typically deploy these in containers, yes, absolutely. Um, in development, um, well, I'll show you how we do it in development in, in a moment, but yeah, absolutely in, uh, in production, we use uh, different types of things. So some projects we use like code deploy or something like that, but a typical approach would be to use Docker um, and uh, various uh, deployment mechanisms for Docker. Um, from like direct scripted um, through to things like um, uh, Kubernetes, but more the, the, the scale of the systems we, we, we kind of work with is more um, scripted type deployment, uh, typically onto AWS or, or uh, a mixture of AWS and, and in-house uh, hardware. Okay, so that's the type of system I'm talking about. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, generate a microservice system for you uh, using Fuge. 
Okay, so what, what's going on under the hood there is that uh, Fuge has run a number of generators. Uh, so it's used Yeoman under the hood. Uh, everyone familiar with Yeoman? No, come on, it's Yeoman. Okay, great. So under the hood, what it's done is it's, it's used uh, Yeoman to run some generators. And it's generated um, a front end, uh, which uses Happy, and then it's, it's generated a couple of uh, Seneca services. So um, if I uh, just show you what the code looks like now. So uh, it's created service one, service two, and we'll just max that up a bit more for you, uh, and a site folder. Uh, so under service one, um, I've got a, a couple of key files. I've got a Docker file, um, and the Docker file is pretty standard. It just uses the base node image um, and uh, to create the container, and then the simple command to run is just to run the service.js file. Um, and the service.js file, um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's, just, it's just using Seneca and it exposes a couple of um, service endpoints, uh, action one and action two. And it's a similar story with service two. So it's very much some simple boilerplate. Um, and then under my, under my site folder, again, I've got a Docker file. Um, and then an API layer, um, which exposes uh, some endpoints to allow me to call those services. So it's really a vanilla uh, code base that I generated there. Um, and then I generated, it's also generated uh, a set of control files. Um, it's generated a composed dev file. So this is a YAML file that uses, uh, just follows the standard uh, Docker Compose uh, syntax. Anyone here familiar with Docker Compose? Yeah, okay, a few people, okay. So do, what, what Docker Compose does is it's a tool to allow you to run a set of containers. So Fuge uses that syntax, but it runs them as processes or as a mixture of processes and <coughs> containers. And I'll, I'll show you why that's a good idea in a moment. Um, there's also then a, a, a config file, which has a number of settings. So in this case, uh, I'm telling Fuge to run Docker containers, uh, to proxy all connections, um, to tail the output from uh, my services by default, uh, and to uh, watch all of my services for changes. Um, so if I, if I just uh, pop back here, I'll show you exactly, um, just try and illustrate what that looks like for you. Uh, so it looks pretty much like this. Um, based on that original architecture I showed you, we've just got a single site at the, front, uh, at the top with an API layer, um, a little proxy in, in place, and then um, a couple of services, okay? Um, and just to reiterate again, it's the composed dev.yaml file and future config files that are actually allowing me to, to run this. Um, each service has a Docker file and the site has a Docker file too. So at the moment, I'm going to spin this system up using Fuge. And what Fuge will do is it will um, start off by reading in this, this uh, uh, Docker compose file. It will then go off and interpret each of the Docker files of the services that are named in there and then spin those processes up. Um, so in order to do that, I run the Fuge shell command. Are you using Kubernetes? Or? No, no, this is nothing to do with Kubernetes. This is purely a development tool. This is, this is to allow you to develop microservices locally, um, not production. Does make sense? Kubernetes does the same? Or? Uh, Kubernetes does, a, does a, a lot more in production. Um, it's, uh, it's talking about Kubernetes, we'll talk about it later, but it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's quite a big complex beast. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is come out of there, and I'm going to do a uh, fuge. So that's now started at the fuge shell, and it's now um, it, it's running proxies because we told it to by default. Um, although in this instance, we don't really need it to do that. If I run the ps command, uh, you'll see that fuge has picked up that there is a front end and two service processes. Okay, so I'm going to have to start those processes up now. So I'm going to have to start all. Um, it's going to kick those processes off. So now I'm running two microservices in the front end with a single command. Uh, and if I now uh, just run over here to my browser, uh, I can reload this page. Um, this is the front end that's just been generated. And if I hit each of these, I'm essentially um, just, just testing each of those action points. Right? So it's, it's making a call through my API, hitting the service, and getting a response. Yes? Is it some kind of... Uh for Docker, this huge? No, it's a development tool. So the idea is to allow you to run services and containers in development with a with a single 
So what we've done is we 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 picked the Docker Compose syntax as, as a standard to use, mm -hmm. but the tool. So you can actually take the, the Compose file that we that, that we generate mm -hmm. um, and actually run it with Docker Compose mm -hmm. or with containers. Um, but the point of doing it this way is it gives you much faster development cycles mm -hmm. because you can you can change processes on the fly without having to rebuild containers every time. So it gives you a much faster development experience when you're running 20 or 30 services on your laptop. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so what I'm going to do next then is... Um, what we're going to do next is um, add another service into the mix. So we're going to generate another service um, and add it into our system. Um, and when we've done that, we're going to end up with a system that looks like this. It's just an additional service uh, sitting on top. Um, I'll do that, and then what I'm going to do after that is I'm going to add some infrastructure into the system. So I'm going to add in a, a, a MongoDB uh, container into the system, um, and then I'm going to hook that in, um, and then we're going to add some additional code to service one um, to allow it to talk to Mongo. So at the end, what we're going to see is a system that looks a bit like this, where we've got a front end, a uh, proxy layer, three services, and one of them we're going to update, so it's going to, it's going to talk to Mongo. And Mongo is going to be running in a container, um, while the other services are going to be running as processes. So, uh, I'm just going to stop this now. Okay, so it's just running the, the Yeoman generator again, and adding another service into the mix. Um, so we get, okay, it's done there. Um, if I now start the feed shell up again, uh, you'll see I've now got a Wimble service in there. And if I spin all those services up, my, my additional service will start, and I can go in and develop that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move off to um, uh, a new, another one which I've pre pre-prepared, which has Mongo baked into it. Um, and we'll just take a quick look at the configuration for this. So I've got three services and a site. <laughs> Um, but now what I've done is I've added in um, a Mongo container there. So I've just pulled that Mongo container from uh, Docker Hub in the, st in the standard way. So Docker pull Mongo, pulls that onto my machine, um, and uh, I, I, I've, I've just added that into my configuration just, just by adding the text in. Um, and then what I've done is in service one, I've changed my service file to add some code, so it's actually going to just um, talk, to, talk to MongoDB. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll start that up. Mm. Okay, so we'll do huge. Uh, so you'll see now when, when I run PS, um, that it's recognized that uh, Mongo is part of the system, um, but it's a type Docker. Um, and then I have a front end and my three other services are part of the system. So this time when I start it up, um, you'll see that the, uh, the MongoDB container is running, um, and they, these are now running as uh, processes. And we can validate that uh, if we just... Uh, if I just do a Docker PS, uh, you'll see that the Mongo container has been started in, in the Docker runtime, whereas everything else is running as a process. So um, what I'm going to do now is flip over here and um, reload this page. So when I hit action two, it's the same as before. But now when I hit uh, action one, uh, you'll see that I'm returning a count. And every time I hit the action, I get an, an incremented count. So what I can do now is um, If I go and edit one of those files, so if I go into service one, and instead of returning the count, I return the count multiplied by two, let's say. So what's happened now is that if you look here, this fuge is watching that service of changes, okay? And it's detected that I've, I've, I've made a change to the JavaScript file uh, in that service, and so it's restarted it for me. So if I now uh, flip back to my front end, uh, and hit action one again, I now get a double account back. Okay? So the idea here is to create a tool that is very similar. If anyone's used uh, uh, Yeoman for web development, 
um, and you've, you've had the automated gold builds running. Anyone had that experience? Right? So the idea is to duplicate that experience, but in a wider context of microservices, so that you can actually uh, spin your system up um, and work with it in, in, with everything integrated, make those changes and have that happen for you rapidly, rather than having to build uh, containers or have very slow development cycles for microservices. Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Peter, where do you, where do you specify that something is run up as a process versus a container? Is that like the composer? Good question, absolutely, yeah. Um, I can show you that right now. So, uh, if you look in the... Um, so the idea was to do this in a, in a way that was as least intrusive as possible. Um, so if you look in the, this is the, again, the standard proposed syntax, right? Uh, you'll note that Mongo is down as an image, okay? Whereas the others have a build name against them. So the way, uh, the way Docker Compose as a tool interprets that is to say, if it's got an image tag, then um, pull it from, from whatever my nominated uh, registry is. Whereas if it's got build, then I need to go find the Docker file at that location and build the container for it, okay? So we adopted exactly the same uh, approach. Um, so if it's, if it's got an image tag, then treat it as a Docker container and try and start it with Docker. Um, and if it's, if it's got a build, then treat it as a process and run it as a process, okay? So what I'll do now is I'll just flip back to service.js and put this back to the way it was. And we should see if we go back to uh, Chrome now, the count is now just incremented in, in units of one. Okay. Okay, so just to call out a few points of what we're doing. Um, one of the things that we're doing now is, is proxying connections between processes and containers. If you ever try to mix processes and containers on a Mac or a Windows system, you'll know that it's quite frustrating because you have a different IP address for all of your containers because they're running in a, docker, in a, in a VM, uh, as opposed to uh, when everything is flat process space, it's all local host, okay? Um, the need for doing that is, is going away. Um, there was, uh, docker have just put out a, a beta version of uh, native support for uh, Windows and Mac, which means the need for this kind of proxy approach um, will hopefully disappear in the near future. Um, but it was, it's certainly something that's been useful um, for us. Um, one of the other things is just for convenience, um, we, uh, under the Fuge folder, we create a log directory and each service has its own log running in there. So you can do post-mortem uh, analysis of those logs if necessary. And there's a grep command in the shell to allow you to search those logs. Um, the other thing to call out is the, uh, is the watch and restart. Um, and that's configurable in, in, in Fusion Config. Um, so if you want to get more of a flavor of, of what Fusion can do, um, there's a full workshop um, available uh, at this location here up on, uh, on um, GitHub. And I'll make sure we'll, we'll distribute this um, around later. Um, and if, if you're interested, go and take a, a walk through that workshop. There's um, you know, examples and solutions of how you can build a system and put it together uh, using the, these blocks. It kind of uses a whole kind of schmorgs board of technologies, um, rickshaw charts, Node, uh, uses Seneca, it uses Mosca, it's kind of an IoT type system, um, and InfluxDB, uh, and also Docker. And um, when you build that system, it looks a bit like this. Uh, you have a front end, uh, where the charts run. Um, it, again, it exposes an API in the way I've spoken about previously. Um, there's a serialization service uh, which talks to InfluxDB, um, an MQTT broker, so Mateo is an MQTT broker there, um, an actuator service, and then a dummy sensor. So there's a bunch of microservices um, sitting in that uh, system. And when you finally get it up and running, it should look a bit like this on the front end. So what I'm going to do is, just as an example, I want to show you that, that system running. Um, so I'm going to have to kill PowerPoint again, aren't I? There we go. So uh, this is what the system looks like. Um, it's got a front end. Uh, it's got a bunch of services, so the actuator, the broker, the InfluxDB uh, database, and so on, um, and then a future config. And the way I'm running this now is to actually separate out the Docker components from, uh, or the infrastructure components from the microservices. 
So um, if you look at the compose file, uh, you'll see that it contains each of those services, uh, and then also an InfluxDB database. Okay. Um, I then separated out uh, a separate infrastructure file just to run InfluxDB, and I've told Fuge uh, in this config here not to run Docker. Uh, so just ignore Docker. Uh, and we sometimes do this in development because uh, it, it's sometimes useful just to leave a bunch of containers, infrastructure containers like, I don't know, uh, Postgres, Mongo, and so on, just running in the background, and then tell your services up and down. Um, so if I pop over here, uh, I can just kick off uh, the infrastructure um, using uh, Docker Compose. So now that's kicked off my InfluxDB container. And um, come out of here, sorry. And then if I just kick off the feed shell again. So you'll notice a, a bit of a difference here as well. I've told Fuge uh, not to proxy all connections, but to just to proxy across the Docker. Um, and also, uh, because we told it not to, not to run Docker containers, it's listing that it knows about Influx, but it's not actually going to do anything to run it. It's just going to run these processes. Um, so if I now start all, um, you should see in a moment, and this is a little bit more verbose. I told them not to tell you. Go. It's died on me. Okay, and we'll just start all again now. I know what I did, sorry, one second. Some processes running around, kicking around, uh, probably in here. Okay. This time, we should be clean. So, if I just load the charging front end again, we should see some data flow flowing through. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so the services are up and running. Um, so, if I go back to the shell here, you'll see all of those services up and running. I've got data streaming through from my dummy sensor uh, into my Influx database, and um, I can actually call the actuator service by sticking a number in there um, and hitting the set button. And you should see a jump in the, in the chart there. Okay? So that's a bit of a more meaty example with a few more services running. Um, and I hope you get the, the idea of mixing containers and processes, and also the, the idea of, of having rapid development of, of groups of services and be able to manage groups of services in one go, uh, rather than having to have lots of little bits of services kicking around and having to script that up um, every time. So uh, just to conclude then, um, what we've got coming up, uh, this is really just the, the, the first iteration of Fuge. Um, we're going to be working on expanding and improving the generators. Um, one area we're looking to improve the generators on is on, uh, is on generating deployment scripts. Um, so that you have a starting position for deployment. Um, we're working to improve the documentation and the examples, so improving the workshops and so on. Um, we're adding in 0x support. Um, so 0x, if you, if you come across it, is an awesome project for doing flame graphs. Uh, it, it runs on uh, 
on Mac. Uh, it's a brilliant tool for profiling. Um, so there'll be a profile uh, command in Fuge so that you don't have to, you don't do run, you do profile, and you'll be able to uh, bring up an individual service for profiling. Uh, we're also going to be adding debugging support uh, so that you're able to tear up all your services and then maybe switch one into debug mode uh, and connect to that one. So that way you debug a service in isolation but within the context of the entire running system. Um, and then finally, um, Docker obviously have updated uh, the compose syntax to, to uh, v2. So we'll be providing full support for the v2 syntax of uh, Docker Compose. Uh, just want to say thanks to, to these awesome guys who've all worked on Fuge. Um, you probably know some of them. And uh, thank you very much for your time. And any questions?